Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this early session for the second day of the UPOP conference. Uh, this morning we have a quite interesting session. Uh, we have two speakers joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, so first, uh, let me welcome uh, Dominique Schmidt, who is joining us from Germany. Uh, Dominique is another of the contributors to the second issue of the journal with a very interesting piece. Uh, but today he's going to talk about something different. So today he's going to talk about the relationship between anti-populism and democracy. Uh, Dominique is a graduate student um, at the Goethe University of Frankfurt and his research interests uh, are in post-structuralist discourse theory, populism, transnational politics, radical democratic theory, and social movements. So I'm sure that some of those uh, different areas will come up in Dominic's speech. Uh, so uh, I suggest we, uh, we start with uh, Dominic's speech. Uh, again, we're going to follow the same format as yesterday. Uh, so the presentation uh, from both speakers first, and then uh, some time for a Q&A session afterwards. So uh, Dominic, Thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas. I hope that you can understand and see me. So thank you very much for having me and I'm really glad and honored um, to contribute to this great conference. And I'm in fact quite sad that I can't be with you in Cyprus. I really considered coming, but in the end it was not really feasible, but I hope that also this hybrid format works as good as it did yesterday. So as Andreas already said in my presentation now, I hope in the next 40 minutes, I will tackle the relationship of anti-populism and democracy. And as you are more than familiar, the phenomenon of populism is ever present in contemporary public and academic discourses. And in response to this populism hype, scholars from the discursive approach to populism have recently launched a novel thrust to the debate by pointing out to, uh, to the phenomenon of anti-populism, which will be at the core of my presentation now. So for the researchers who mainly coined the term, anti-populism is a political logic that discredits the phenomenon of populism in general and thus depicts it as a threat to democracy. And Although a growing number of scholars underscore the importance of analyzing anti-populism in relationship with populism, they still uh, complain that it remains an under-researched phenomenon. So in my presentation, I hope to tackle this lacuna in the literature by providing an in-depth conceptualization of anti-populism and to illuminate an area which so far has rather been neglected by analyzing the relationship between the logic of anti-populism and the logic of democracy. And yeah, before I go over to my main claim, I have here um, selected uh, three quotes, the other one you can see on the next slide, um, from three really important scholars of populism who also uh, touched upon the concept of anti-populism. For example, we have Jan Werner Müller, who warns that the danger is that anti-populism becomes structurally like populism itself. So because they wish to exclude, we exclude them. And likewise, Cass Müller said that anti-populism is the mirror image of populism, which means that it is also monist and moralist and therefore loathes compromise. And th there we had two scholars rather from the ideational camp here we have uh, with Janis Gafrakakis, a scholar of the discursive camp, who emphasizes that both populist and anti-populist discourses can acquire democratic or anti-democratic forms, so that it really depends on the case at hand. And yeah, what I try to show with these three quotes is that um, the, the prevailing a picture in the debate is that populism and anti-populism are a keen in their relation to democracy. We have Müller and Müller who say 
that it's an equal threat to democracy like populism. So that's comparable in this sense. And we have Yanis Safakakis who says that both phenomena can be either democratic or undemocratic or anti-democratic. And I try to, in my presentation, to, to challenge this conflation of populism and anti-populism when it comes to the tie to democracy by claiming that while populism cannot per se be perceived as a threat to democracy, anti-populism can because it attacks completely the construction of the people and thus anti-populism is imminently anti-democratic. And in order to substantiate this rather controversial argument, I will first um, go over the theoretical framework by briefly explaining the discursive approach of populism and the interlinked concept of anti-populism. And then in the second part of my conceptualization, I will describe the distinct approach to democracy that I will take, which is based on the work of Oliver Marchiat. And by going over the work of Oliver Marchiat, I try to develop some sort of a democratic litmus test for political actors, which I then, in a last step, apply to the phenomena of populism and anti-populism. So first I develop the three concepts of populism, anti-populism and democracy. And then in the end, I will try to put them in perspective and relation. So to get started with the discursive approach to populism, um, which was or which um, was mainly developed by the pioneering work of Ernesto Laclau, who outlined that populism is a discourse in which the people claims to be the true democratic sovereign and thereby stands in an antagonistic relationship to the elites. So we have two minimal criteria of populism, first people centrism and second anti elitism And within the swing work, um, neither the people nor the elites are treated or perceived as a given group but they are always the result of a performative and discursive act. So there's no naturally given people or elites. It's always the result of a performative act in a discourse. And from this rather formal approach to populism also follows that populism is exclusively perceived as a special form of political articulation without any predetermined political ideology or connotation. So populism is treated as a neutral phenomena, which doesn't have any pejorative or positive attributes before it's linked to the distinct ideology. Yet yeah, to grasp these essential features of the discursive logic, Laclau utilized a really complex vocabulary. And yeah, in the next slides, I try to make it um, yeah, a bit more comprehensible because it's quite important later for the differentiation between populism and anti-populism. So um, for Laclau, all meaningful practices of constructing identities of subjects and objects take place in a discourse through the means of antagonism and political frontiers. So Laclau says that within a discourse, um, the, the basic units of analysis are demands and that these demands are differential in nature, which he calls logic of difference. So in a discourse, there are different demands present that have from the outset not so much in common. And from this foundation, Laclau then asks, how can we create collective identities, although we have this logic of difference in the discourse? And he says that these differential demands can be linked together through a performative act in a chain of equivalence. However, so the chain of equivalence is always the linkage between the differential demands. However, according to Laclau, this equivalential chain cannot consist of any positive criteria. So in order to link the different demands together, he says that we need 
to have two things. First, a radical negative outside that forges the different demands together. And second, a common name, which he calls empty signifier, that becomes representative of all the other demands. So an empty signifier becomes some sort of the umbrella that links together the differential demands. And in the case of populism, Laclau says that the people is the empty signifier beneath which the differential demands merge into a chain of equivalence. So under the roof of the people, all demands unite together. However, um, the people also requires a radical outside um, to forge this collective identity. Um, so we need a radical outside, an antagonist against which the individual demands can be opposed and linked together. And in the case of populism, um, this negative outside is usually occupied by the elites. So, yeah, bringing this all together, um, we have in a discourse differential demands, um, which form an equivalent chain under the umbrella of the empty signifier of the people, which is then pit uh, in an antagonistic relation against the elites. Yeah, and from this quite complex discourse theory, then scholars of the discursive approach have developed a more straightforward definition. So basing um, this definition on the cloud, they say that populism can be defined as a dichotomic discourse in which the people are juxtaposed to the elite, primarily along the lines of a down-up antagonism. So having developed this, we can now go over to the um, concept of anti-populism, um, which builds up on the main foundations of the discursive approach. And quite importantly, it does not only treat populism as a conceptual lens, but also um, it analyzes how the word populism is used in a discourse. So by applying this concept of anti-populism, the focus is shift from a concept also to a unit of analysis in a discourse. And thereby, anti-populism is perceived as a political logic that discredits all forms of populism. So populism is portrayed as an irrational phenomenon and imminent threat to democracy. Um, and there is um, the construction of an antagonism between populism and anti-populist actors. And um, as it was the case for, for populism, um, anti-populism is not um, yeah, a priori linked to a specific ideological content so that we can have different forms of anti-populism, for example, neoliberal, socialist, right or left anti-populism. And the only uniting feature of all these different forms of anti-populism is this antagonism between pro and anti-populist actors. And yeah, this can again also uh, be explained with um, the Laclauian discourse theory. So to recall um, for Laclau, an empty signifier is needed um, that unites um, the multitude of differential demands under one roof by sharing a radical negative outside. And in the case of anti-populism, this radical outside against which the differential demands link together is populism. So mm, put differently, the only element that the different demands um, and positions in the chain of equivalence have in common is their shared difference to the radical negative outside of populism. And then there's also an empty signifier needed um, for the chain of equivalence itself. And usually it's something like liberal Democrats or the Democrats, so, so that there's an antagonism drawn between the liberal Democrats and populism, which is also present in this quote here from Oliver Marchard, who says that um, anti-populism creates an antagonism between us liberal Democrats and the populist anti-Democrats. And thereby populism is presented as an irrational, authoritarian, illiberal, and immoral project that infringes democratic standards.
yeah, bring this together. Um, Anti-populism can be defined as a political logic that demonizes the phenomenon of populism in total by depicting an antagonism between pro and anti-populist actors, whereby the latter, so um, popul no, the for, for, no, the latter is presented as imminent threat to democracy. So, and yeah, this can also be seen in some real world examples, as I still have a lot to, to say and to go over. I will rather stay briefly at these quotes and pick out two of them, maybe two striking ones. So we can see here Pope Francis, who, which is quite interesting, uh, talked or talks a lot about populism. And he even draws a direct line of the fascism of the uh, from the early 20th century to populism nowadays, which also explains his quote where he says, populism is evil and ends badly. And with ends badly, he means the end of the fascist regimes in the 1940s. So it's quite a strong comparison. And maybe another example we have on the right side, uh, Stefan Romans, uh, who wrote a really influential article together with Cohen Atz, and who also contributed to the Oxford Handbook of Populism. And therein he says that populism should be branded as dangerous threat. And what all these different quotes have in common um, is that populism becomes some sort of a stand in for a threat to democracy and thereby all the different populist movements are conflated and they become one negative connotated phenomena uh, that endangers liberal democracies as such. Yeah, so then we can go from the concepts of populism and anti-populism to the um, concept of democracy. And as I've already touched upon, I will thereby um, rely on the work of Oliver Marchardt, um, who developed a post-foundational theory which also has some radical democratic implications. So to start um, here, like the two basic premises of Oliver Marchardt's uh, political ontology. So he situates his whole reasoning on the premise that foundationalism is in a sustained crisis. And he thus outlines that societies can never reach a final ground. However, this implosion of an ultimate ground, for example, in the past religion, does not result in an absence of a ground as a whole, which then would be a theory of anti-foundationalism. But instead, he emphasizes um, the plural, contingent and temporary nature of grounds. So he says we can never have a fixed final foundation and ground of society, um, but that there will always be contingency. And to follow this reasoning, um, also his concept of antagonism is indispensable that he mainly derives from the work of uh, Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. And he elaborates that because of the impossibility of a final peaceful state of society, there will always be conflict for the partial founding attempts of society. So he identifies some sort of a core originality of contingency and conflict um, because there, there cannot be a final ground, there is contingency, and because of this contingency, there will always be conflict to actualize the final ground and vice versa. Um, because there's conflict, there will always be contingency. And he names this core originality uh, core co-originality of conflict and contingency antagonism. So bringing these basic features together in his political ontology, uh, Marchardt uh, touches up on the impossibility of an ultimate ground and um, elaborates on the therefrom emerging conflict and contingency. And um, this obviously has also some implications for his conceptualization of democracy. So in his work, Marchardt has so far not really engaged in detail with this nexus of post-foundationalism and democracy. However, at some parts 
or in some parts of his work, um, yeah, he refers to it. And so I tried to just put these different puzzle pieces together. So as you might already anticipate, his radical democratic reflections go far beyond um, the classical institutionalist notion of democracy. Um, so democracy as a governmental regime. And instead, um, he elevates these post-foundational criteria of contingency and conflict um, to two indispensable pillars for democracy. So instead of perceiving democracy as a system of governance, he rather understands it as a societal arrangement that must respect and take into consideration contingency and conflict. However, um, he says that post the post foundation criteria are not sufficient alone for democracy and that there's also the necessity for um, an ethical and a political dimension. So, um, yeah, Marcia emphasizes um, thus that there's no direct road from contingency to democracy um, because he clarifies that contingency alone is not a unique selling point of democracy. Uh, because it rather occupies a universal status and that contingency and conflict can also lead to unfavorable conditions. So he says that contingency and conflict are necessary but not sufficient conditions for democracy that he summarizes in this catchy claim that not every post-foundational politics is democratic, but every democratic politics is post-foundationalist which simply means um, that contingency and conflict are indispensable, but not sufficient alone. And this obviously um, leads to the question, what else must be present for democratic regime alongside conflict and contingency, according to Marchert? And as I've already said, he says that there need, need to be two other dimensions. First, um, he outlines um, an ethical dimension of democracy that stresses the necessity of political actors to accept contingency and conflict. And in order to do so, they must subject their own universal claims to constant scrutiny. And therewith, Marchat says, they can prevent the claim of absoluteness of their own position. So for Marcia, this ethics of self alienation satisfies the post foundational criteria of conflict and contingency. And he names this whole ethical dimension uh, with the great hangman words, self questioning acceptance dispositive, which sounds in German even more interesting uh, because in German it's selbst in Fragestellungs Akzeptanz dispositive. And this is simply the name for his ethical dimension. And as I will show in a second, this dimension, this ethical dimension, together with the post foundational criteria, can work as a democratic litmus test for political actors. Yeah, and then there's also his second dimension, the political dimension of democracy, that touches upon the need for institutions to enforce democratic principles. However, um, for my work, only the first, the ethical dimension is relevant because the ethical dimension um, refers to the actor's discourse, while this political dimension rather um, touches upon the institutional preservation of the democratic principles. So, yeah, we can leave this as, uh, aside. And yeah, so for our purpose, um, this self-questioning acceptance dispositive is important because if you if you reframe it, um, it can really work as a litmus test for political actors. So um, one can say that if an actor or discourse respects the post foundational criteria of contingency and conflict together with the constant questioning of its own hegemonic claims, he, she or it, can be perceived as democratic. And the other side of the coin is that if an actor's own claim to universality undermines the condition of contingency, then the actor erodes democracy itself because this discourse suppresses conflict. So this quite abstract litmus test uh, we will now apply 
to populism and anti-populism and I think then it becomes more uh, clear um, yeah, how it can work in the application to political actors. So yeah, this is the little summary of Marshall's um, democratic theory. And yeah, this now brings us to the um, relationship of democracy and populism, which um, yeah, should serve as a point of departure for the last step of comparing anti-populism and democracy. So yeah, um, here on the slide, uh, there are two memes uh, that circulated on Twitter uh, the last year. And I think that they capture perfectly the two main positions and maybe also stereotypes in the debate, because why for liberal scholars, populism becomes the stand in for almost everything and usually negatively connotated phenomena um, for radical democratic scholars, they are always under suspicion to equalize populism with democracy. And now in this section, I try to sit in between these shares and hopefully provide a more nuanced perception um, of the relation between populism and democracy. So yeah, um, I will present four different claims regarding the relationship between populism and democracy. And the first one is that populism as a political logic is indispensable for the emergency of or the emergence of democracy. So the people um, occupies a central rule in democracies, which is greatly um, summarized by Ernesto Laclau, who says that democracy is grounded only on the existence of a democratic subject. Thus, the very possibility of democracy depends on the constitution of a democratic people. And yeah, this conclusion may seem tautological at first, but it really has far reaching consequences since neither the democratic subject, the people, nor democracy itself are given entities. Um, from this follows that um, they both must be constructed. So also the people must be brought into place by something. And for Marchard and Laclau, um, this something is populism. So populism becomes the political logic that creates and constructs the democratic subject of the people. So uh, both um, Laclau and Marchard um, argue that populism as a political logic is indispensable um, for, the, um, up, uh, for the emergence of the democratic subject and thus democracy itself. Um, also, the inverse argument can be made that the democratic revolution is, indispens is an indispensable precondition for populism. So again, Oliver Marchard um, suggested that not only is populism a precondition for democracy, but that the converse is also applicable. So he says that populism presupposes the democratic revolution as a historical event by which the name of the people assumed the function of a sovereignty without sovereign. So in other words, he mainly claims with a recourse to Claude Lefort and his democratic revolution that the democratic revolution was an indispensable historical precondition for populism because it introduced the norm of popular sovereignty and thereby also established the people as the central actor of democracy. So um, yeah, it, it uh, can also be said, um, okay, I have to hurry up a bit. So um, from this also follows um, that with the democratic revolution, um, the people became the central actor of democracy. However, they co could not really draw on any transcendent source of legitimacy like the monarch could do before. And that's why uh, Claude de Ford defined his famous dictum that the empty place of power became, uh, yeah, was established by the democratic revolution, which just de describes the change from the monarchical era to the democratic era. And he says that no political actor um, could ultimately identify with the place of power anymore um, because he can only occupy um, this place of power for a restricted time. And Marcia then also, um, expands this logic to the people. So he says that 
the people became the democratic subject par excellence, um, but that they cannot fully and permanently close this empty place of power and that thus there will always be conflict about um, gaining this place of power for a temporary time. Yeah, um, and then this relation of populism and democracy um, is one of interdependency, which follows from the previous remarks. Um, as because without the democratic revolution, there's no popular sovereignty, rendering the people as main political subject. And without populism, there's no discursive embodiment of the democratic subject. However, um, from this um, cannot be deduced that every phenotype of populism is democratic, because that would um, presuppose some sort of predetermined identity of the people. Um, which runs counter to everything I just said about the conceptualization of the discursive approach um, of populism. So um, as uh, in the post-foundational approach, um, any fixed connotation of the people is rejected. We need something else to judge whether the people is democratic and populism is democratic or not. And it's here where the litmus test for democratic actors can enter the stage and help defining whether an, an actor is democratic or not. So um, to recall, a political actor can be considered democratic if the discourse respects the post-foundational criteria of contingency and conflict and harbors this democratic ethic of constantly self-questioning the own claims. And this concept, um, or this test was also applied in some way by different scholars of the discursive approach um, to populism, who then outlined that populism as such is democratic, but that the populist discourse can undermine democracy when it conveys an essentialist notion of a true people for whom the populist actor claims so representation. So it depends on the particular discursive construction of the people, whether um, populism in a specific case is democratic or not. So to provide two examples, if we have this ethnic, biological, fixed notion of the people, which is present in a lot of far-right populist discourses, then this runs obviously counter to this litmus test because it describes the fixed notion of the people. However, if we um, take some left-wing populist actors or movements like Occupy Wall Street or the Indignados, then the people um, is not something fixed, but which is simply um, yeah, constructed in the discourse and which also um, harbors some differences. So there's no biological essentialist notion of the people in a lot of left-wing populist discourses. So in the end, it really depends and rests on the ideology, I would claim, um, and the scholars of the discursive approach would claim, um, it depends on the conveyed ideology, whether a populist discourse can be judged democratic or not. So one really has to look at the distinct uh, case. Yeah, and this is the summary, really short. Um, it can be said that not every form of populism is democratic but every democratic order rests at least to some extent on populism. So it depends on the specific case at hand and the distinct construction of the people, whether a certain populist actor can be perceived as democratic or not. Yeah, which is also here in my claim. And this brings us to the, to the final step, um, um, namely the relationship of anti-populism and democracy. And before I go over to these really abstract arguments about anti-populism and democracy, I first um, have a little detour where I look at neoliberal anti-populism. Um, so uh, neoliberal anti-populism is currently the most prevailing form of anti-populism, which is far from being a coincidence because it mirrors the dominant neoliberal hegemony. And as it was, repeatedly and convincingly pointed out from Shantan Mouf, this neoliberal hegemony established a post-democratic condition in which politics, quote, 
has become a mere issue of managing the established order, a domain reserved for experts and popular sovereignty has been declared obsolete. However, it has been become widely accepted that this post -politic, uh, politics diagnosis has lost um, a lot of its fuel in the aftermath of the financial crisis um, and the um, accompanying um, politicization. So populism stepped in after the financial crisis and really highlighted the hypocrisy of this. There is no alternative politics of the neoliberal rational consensus. So um, yeah, this whole hegemony became under fire after the financial crisis. Yet this emergence of uh, populism does not completely bless the time of post politics. Um, rather, on the contrary, as Oliver Marsh had claimed, um, this uh, or the economic and financial crisis ushered in a new, more aggressive phase of post politics. And this more aggressive phase of post politics is marked by anti populism. So Oliver Marshall says that the new tool in the neoliberal box is anti-populism and thereby anti-populism uh, reveals itself as a reactionary discursive strategy in a time where the neoliberal pense unique comes increasingly under fire. So in a time where this consensus oriented depoliticization could no longer alone manifest the hegemony because populism showed that there were alternatives on the table. Um, yeah, new, uh, the neoliberal discourse had to change some sort of its strat strategy and thereby anti-populism stepped in and became a means to eradicate um, the alternative political projects. Um, so the neoliberal anti-populism really uh, drew an antagonism um, between the um, liberal Democrats and the populist anti-Democrats. And this is also reflected in the quotes here on the slide. So we have Agridopoulos who says that populism becomes the rubbish bin of the ruling elite and a criticism of their neoliberal policies from whatever direction is defamed. Or we have Jacques Rancière who famously argued that populism is the convenient name that lumps together every form of dissent in relation to the prevailing consensus. And we have Yorgos Katsambikis who outlined that anti-populism emerges as a distinct discourse of repertoire or even a political weapon aiming at the discrediting uh, of disagreement and the marginalization of the people and the democratic dissent. Yeah, and this really quickly, um, there's like this twofold corrosion of democracy by this discourse. First, um, we have the suppression of democratic competition. So by presenting uh, the neoliberal hegemony without an, uh, having any alternative, because all political competitors are portrayed as threats to democracy, this undermines um, the basic premises of democracy and the basic features of contingency and conflict because they are artificially erased and from the democratic playing field and neoliberalism some sort of becomes the only responsible game in town. And then um, as a second point, there's also the direct attack of the democratic subject of the people via the empty signifier of populism. Um, because with this wholesale rejection of populism, the X is also laid to the basic democratic premise of the constitution of the people. Because before I said from this post foundational perspective, populism is needed to construct the democratic subject of the people. And when you criticize populism as a whole, um, also this democratic subject cannot be put into place. Yeah. Which can be summarized as neoliberal populism is anti-democratic because it impedes the constitution of the people, suppresses conflict and thus negates contingency. Yeah, and really quickly in the last step, <laughs> now I try to demonstrate that anti-populism as such is anti-democratic and that its relationship does not oscillate for different phenotypes. So I try to show that um, the argument I just brought forward against neoliberal anti-populism can also be made to all other forms of anti-populism. And yet to understand why anti-populism as such is anti-democratic, 
um, it's maybe helpful to, to go back to the relationship of populism and democracy, uh, where I said that it depends on the conveyed ideology and the respective construction of the people, um, whether an actor or a populist discourse is democratic or not. And this is, um, in fact, the difference between populism and anti-populism, because for anti-populism, it is really the form of articulation that is in itself imminently anti-democratic. So these imminent uh, democracy undermining tendencies um, of neoliberal anti-populism are not due to the ideology, so neoliberalism, but that they are already part of the political articulation and the political logic as such. Um, because as I will show in a second, this logic suppresses conflict and contingency and denounces the people as political actors. So it's therefore indifferent whether the discursive logic is supplemented by conservative, progressive, nationalist or neoliberal views. Um, so the arguments I just put forward against neoliberal anti-populism can be extended to all forms of anti-populism. So from a post-foundation perspective, one argue, could argue that anti-populism is per se anti-democratic because it, it suppresses contingency and conflict and demonizes the emergence of the people. And these were exactly the essential pillars of, of democracy. And utilizing the, the concepts of Oliver Marchard, um, one can say that anti-populism as a political logic um, subverts this self-questioning acceptance dispositive because by homogenizing all political challenges and branding them as danger under the name of populism, the anti-populist um, uh, the anti-populist essentializes its own views because if you have no alternatives and no competitors, your own view essentializes um, and absolutizes the hegemonic position. So it can be said that the anti-populist discourse not only undermines the ethical imperative of questioning the own claims, but also erases contingency and conflict. So to sum up, it can be said um, that there cannot be a democratic anti-populism if by anti-populism we understand the blanket rejection of all forms of populism. And the difference, now we can go over to the, to the summary. Um, so the difference between anti-populism and populism lies in the fact that for populism, it varies from case to case, whether it's anti-democratic or not. Whereas for anti-populism, it's part of the political logic, it's part of the articulation, so it's part of the concept itself, that it is anti-democratic. Um, have it here on my concluding slide. So uh, in the end, um, yeah, I tried to convey in the presentation that there's an interdependency of populism and democracy. However, that populism is not per se democratic or anti-democratic, but that it depends on the specific case at hand. And for anti-populism, it's inherently anti-democratic because it's already ingrained in the form of articulation. So I tried to show uh, that there's a difference between populism and anti-populism when it comes to democracy, and that there cannot be uh, such a thing than uh, anti um, democratic anti-populism. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope that I still was in time. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. That, that was actually quite fascinating. Um, I do have many thoughts on that, but let's save it <laughs> for the end of the session. Um, so thank you, Dominique. You can stop sharing your presentation now, and we may proceed to the second presentation of the first session. Uh, this will be delivered by uh, Kiara Kastaman. Uh, who is also a contributor to the second issue of the journal, and she is today going to uh, present her paper um, um, uh, that was published in that journal on uh, the populism in India and Indonesia, uh, a post-structuralist approach to Modi and Jacobi's public performance. Uh, that's a very interesting paper, so I urge everyone to um, pop over to the LOPO uh, website and have a look at, at Kiara's piece. Uh, it's quite interesting 
and I'm sure that it will make for a very interesting presentation. So, Kira, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and we will return towards the end of this session with a Q&A for both uh, Chiara and Dominique. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, Andreas. Do you mind, um, do you want me to share it or do you mind sharing it uh, because I sent you the link? It's yes, I, I do have your presentation, whatever you prefer. If I share it, then I will be the one who's going to be controlling it. That's so, fine, yeah. Okay. So just a minute, let me share it with you. Thank you. Um, well, as Andrea was, was saying, um, I'm going to present my my paper on the study of Modi and Jokowi's performances. I'm going to use a public structuralist discourse analysis. Uh, do you mind going to the next one, please? Oh, sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so one of the important things to, to, to mention here is that even though this analysis is from the data that I extracted from 2015 to 2019, both leaders remain in power at the moment and they have been accused of several human rights violations and several attacks to democracy, democracy in their respective countries. Um, either way, uh, in, in this paper, I use data from national speeches and the tweets well, from their personal Twitter accounts uh, to analyze how they construct this, this thing that, that Dominic was saying, this idea of the people, how do they construct it through the discourse and their practices uh, in public. Next one, please. Okay, so why is that is important to analyze these two cases? India and, and Indonesia have been um, appointed at, at, as remarkable examples of democratization in the world, mainly because they are large countries with a huge regional diversity. They are multilingual, multicultural. They are really, on paper, really hard to handle. Um, countries because they are so big and diverse. However, it's been almost, well, around 70 years of democracy um, in each country, and both have been implemented, implementing important advances on electoral and liberal dimensions of democracy. So this is why these countries have been used as, um, as an example, a good example of democracy, in, especially in Asia. Um, India is a federal government that follows a constitution the, that protects civil liberties. They have periodic and free elections, freedom of assembly. Likewise, in Indonesia, they follow the rule of law, uh, although it's a, a presidential electoral system. But nevertheless, the specialists have been reporting of seemingly illiberal changes uh, to democracy in both countries, mainly because um, they have been reporting in increasing incidences of human rights violations, which makes us wonder how, how is that that these are examples of, of remarkable um, democratization in the world. We have in India that since the victory of the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, and I'm sorry about my pronunciation, but this, um, this is known as the BJP. In 2014, when Narendra Modi um, took power of India, since that moment, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have been reporting um, several human rights violations that can be attributed to the government or the military, but also to the civilians. Among these crimes, we can find um, arbitrary detentions, torture, rapes, lynching, and murders. But what it is um, striking and, and, and what it is making us wonder how is that that we can claim that democracy is under threat 
is that um, India is a country with a progressive legal reform where the courts are, are ruling regularly, but despite this, uh, the judiciary has failed to punish crimes in which the victims are Dalit, Adivasi, or Muslim. Um, additionally, when the opposition or independent, independent media try to report this, 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 um, these crimes, they have been persecuted and silenced. So this is the reason that, that makes us well, this is alerting everyone uh, about the state of democracy democracy in, in India. While in Indonesia, the story is really similar. Joko Widodo also assumed power in 2014. And since that moment, the same organizations have been reporting uh, crimes against Chinese Buddhist minorities, Christians and Hindu minorities. Um, there has also been a, a really lengthy conflict in West Papua affecting, um, actually attacking the media who was reporting about the abuses committed by the government. So the, these are not isolated cases in the world. We've seen that recently the strength of especially liberal democracy has been questioned all around the world. We've seen this um, in really well-established democrat democratic countries such as the US when where Donald Trump was acting apparently non in a non-democratic way. We've seen this in Hungary with Viktor Orban. We've seen this in Brazil with Bolsonaro. We've seen this with the PIS in Poland or with Duterte in the Philippines where the leaders have been acting apparently against um, the democratic stability they, 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 they have. So scholars have named these political phenomena differently, like the decline of democracy, the pullback to authoritarianism, the retreat of democracy, the crisis of democracy, breakdown of democracy, backsliding of democracy, among others. But what all of these categories have in common is that all of the specialists have been studying this retreat of democracy or this affection to democracy through the public performances of political leaders. And this is why um, populism theories came back to the to the debate. And they, that is the reason that I, I'm, I'm using it. Um, I'm, I'm analyzing these two cases through populism theories because there's a, a, an important focus on the illiberal decisions and behavior of the political leaders. Next one, please. Thank you. So this is, um, as I said, this is a, a qualitative study in which I analyze the, um, I try to, to, to explain and demonstrate what is this definition or construction of the people that these leaders promote. As, as Dominic was saying, these, these changes in, in different contexts, and I want to demonstrate which ones are the ones that Modi and, and Jokowi are using. And I also um, explore how is this identification between the leaders and the citizenship um, achieved? How is that the actual people, like the, the, the humans, are identifying themselves with this notion of the people that the leaders construct through the, their discourse? I combine two frameworks. I use Francisco Paniza's framework, who takes populism as a mode of identification with the people, the citizens. And I also use Pierre Ossigais, who proposed a social cultural approach to populism. And to do so, I apply post structuralist uh, discourse analysis and manifest content analysis, because I, I use not only the, the discourse in, in terms of words, but I take the whole symbolic package, the, the way the message has been delivered, the place where it has been delivered, and among others. Next one, please. So here we start with the, um, what Francisco Paniza proposes. Uh, to Paniza, the political space is simplified 
by its symbolic division between the people and its other, who in this case is the ruling elite. And to define them, we, we need to assume the people and the ruling elite as political identities. And as Dominic was explaining before, um, the, these, these political identities and this whole idea of, of the construction of them come from Laclau. Um, Vanessa takes three main characteristics to, to define the, the political identity, identities. First is that they are complex. They are constantly changing uh, positionalities in societies and they are affected by the, by the contingencies from within at the personal level and, with, uh, and from without at the um, society level. Identities are also relational because they are constructed based on the expectations that the other has um, of you, of themselves and the, of the whole relationship. And this one is perhaps the most important one is that identities are incomplete. The necessity of identifying with something or someone happens because there's no clear or full identity defined in the first place. Uh, this is what Laclau calls the constitutive lack of political identities, uh, which states that identities are never fully structured. And here is where, where populist leaders come in, into the picture. Since identities and the identity of the people isn't set, they, there's always the possibility of create them or recreate them and change this definition of who, the, who are the people and how do we represent them. Um, next one, please. <laughs> but as I was saying, there's also, um, we, we have that the, the populist leader is presenting and using a, a definition of the people, but we also need to explain how is that the people are recognizing themselves within this definition. Here is when I, I use the framework proposed by Pierre Ostigai. He proposes that, um, Populist leaders try to, they, 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 they use a strategy of, of turning upside down um, social markets from the low that, that, that he calls the social basis. And then he tries to, um, well, to, to invert this, this social division between the ruling elite and, and the social basis. To make myself more clear, populist leaders appeal to those who feel politically excluded, or he calls them the low, by emphasizing um, by emphasizing some social markers that are corresponding to the um, popular culture. If we associate this with Pierre Bourdieu's theory, will be like trying to take like the popular the popular culture to the high and this is a way to elevate the low the social basis and make them or, or recognize them as holders of sovereignty so this um is a way of um this is a way in which populist leaders hold an allure for the low and elevate them and this kind of changes the this status quo in, in this division between the ruling elite and the rest of the people. When the rest of the people feel empowered and recognized by the leaders, this is the moment when they they kind of um, assume this whole definition of who the people are. Next one, please. So. This is a um, well, brief summary of all the indicators that I use to um, analyze the discourse. This is based on, oh sorry, this is based on, on Pierre Ostigai's framework of the flaunting of the law. And he states that there are some key elements to recognize how the populist leader is trying to, to flaunt 
the social basis through their discourse. So first we will find that a populist leader will have an anti-elite rhetoric when leaders are claiming that they represent the people in such a way that, that they have never been before, that no other previous leader has, uh, has done before. So populist leaders will um, will accuse the, 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 the previous politicians of being corrupt, of, of being the reason that the country isn't developing um, or being the, the, the responsibles of the poverty in the country, etc. Secondly, we have an emphasis on closeness. Populist leaders will claim that they speak on behalf of the truth or reality. They will say that um, they understand they understand the necessities and fears of the people because they have been there. They have been one of them. They have been in on the ground, and and that's the reason why they they can represent them and make decisions for them. Third, we have that the authorities conceived as personalistic rather than institutional. Uh, up to Pierre Ostigai, a populist leader or a populist script will uh, have a, a, an important focus on the authority and the personality um, of the leader. It will be act, uh, something like uh, the, the political leader is a superhero that can act despite the legislation, beyond the law, and they can actually make great things happen. The fourth one is that the, there's another, it's also an empty signifier, that one, that can be can perceived as a threat. And these, obviously, the other isn't defined. It can take any form. It can be the migrants. It can be uh, the foreigners. I can be religious or ethnic minorities. But what, or whoever they are, they are the reason that the country isn't moving on. They are the reason that the country isn't developing. They are the cause of crime, uh, the cause of poverty, and etc. And finally, um, the polit uh, politics are represented as accessible uh, through a populist discourse. This means that um, the populist leader can embody local um, or popular expressions that include modes, include practices, include places they go, everything that I can make you feel that they are um, the heartland um, of that country. Next one, please. So this this whole idea of um, populism as a strategy that that will show through the whole discourse or public performance um, is, is based on politics of equivalence that um, Dominic was explaining before. And, and I don't want to go into much detail on, on this one, but in terms of my methodology, the one I use on my study, uh, I took the post-structuralist discourse theory to analyze how this notion or concept or idea of the people is, is constructed. To do so, I use these chains of equivalence uh, that by basically work that to fixate a meaning, we need to follow all the, the signs that have been placed as equivalent to that meaning. This meaning will be the no doubt point, in, in this case is the people. And I will present how Modi and Jokowi build this chain of equivalence to define who an Indian or an Indonesian person should be like. Next one, please. Okay, um, as I said, I use two different sources in, in this study. I have the um, data that comes from nat National Day public speeches, and I chose these ones because they were addressed to the whole nation. And I also analyzed the tweets delivered by Modi and Jokowi between 2015 and 2019. I used, when I did this study, Social Bearing, which is a, an online platform that retrieves tweets and could tell you which is the word that um, 
that was mentioned most of the time uh, in in each account. So we have that Modi um, used the most the word people, whereas Jokowi used JKW, just trying to refer to himself. Uh, next one, please. Um, and as I said, I, I analyzed the whole data as a, as a symbolic package that, that included not only the message, but also the manner, the setting, and, and that, that's why I use, I combine manifest content, uh, content analysis with post-structuralist discourse analysis to get a whole idea of what was going on. <laughs> and so we can get into the results now, and we have this quote. Um, but I, you can get into the to the um, journal website and 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 take a look to the whole paper, and there are more quotes. But this one is one of the most representative ones, in which we can see this is a quote of Modi, and we can see how. Um, he starts his his um, speech referring as uh, uh, India as if it was a team. Uh, he says he says Team India is a big team of um, blah 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 blah. But what what happens is that Team India is is not just an idea of, of creating a nation that where everyone collaborates together. Team India was actually one policy that he tried to implement in two thousand fourteen. Um, and here we can see, um, I'm not sure if you can read it properly, but we can see in green, like the, the signs are next to um, India, <laughs> trying to get a, an idea of who he is trying to represent as an Indian person or not. He thinks the nation is a team, he's a big team of 25 crores, which is 10 million countrymen, a team uh, of citizens working as in, uh, working as a team together, etc. But what he is actually doing here is is trying to to make this team India idea, which was um, it was was one policy that in 2014 Modi tried to implement. It was trying to get the prime minister, the chief ministries, and the union of council of ministries all together to work as a single office. So he was he was trying to increase the power of the executive by um, joining all the forces together. And that was called Team India, and that was trying to take the country ahead. Um, so to Modi, his political initiative it's equivalent to the idea of the nation. This idea of he's trying to to emphasize that the country and its citizens were now a product that he created, and that is working and and trying to let like, to to be a big nation of development and and so on. Uh, we can go to the next one, please. Um, here we can see uh, another extract of um, Modi referring to the nation, and he refers to them with, um, well, he he's saying like, my dear countrymen, brothers and sisters, we are the inheritors inheritors of Asian legacy of Vedas, and and he tries to to create this idea of brotherhood with fellows who are also um, born from Hinduism. And that's something that is really common on, on his speeches. He's always recalling uh, sacred figures of Hinduism, despite of the great religious diversity in India. And we can see here also, he, um, he refers again of, oh, sorry. Uh, as the nation is as brothers or sisters, they are fellows. He's trying to take here that himself to the same level of the citizens because 
they are all working together to, to create this Team India. Um, we can go to the, second, the next one, please. And so, so far we have that to, to Modi or through Modi's discourse, an Indian person or the Indian people should be brothers and sisters that can trace back to their uh, Hindu uh, figures' um, roots and, and that they are all together working towards this uh, developed idea of Team India. However, when we try to analyze how he's trying to get the people into this, the same boat uh, of his idea of, of the nation, we have first these, uh, we, we follow Pierre of the Guy's framework. We have now the anti-elite rhetoric in Modi's discourse. It's really clear. We can see in the highlighted, uh, what the green, in the green, highlighted words. This is a quote of Modi from 2015, and he is not directly mentioning uh, any other party or any prior politician, but he's saying that there was a time when things uh, were moving on. There was a time when India was considered poor. There was a time when India was uh, paralyzed. There was a time when the, uh, the reforms were delayed, but now it has changed. Now we all are going to work to, towards this new India. Now India is going to be recognized as um, a rich country. Um, and this is, is somehow interesting because um, he will never be specifically clear um, in, in, on this strategy. He will be just trying to um, focus on the hope of a, a, a better, fruit, a brighter future that is on his hands. And can we go to the next one, please? If we go to the second variable of the planting of the law, we have the, um, the emphasis on, on closeness, as we reviewed before. And this is probably the one, the feature of, of the flaunting of the law that Modi exploits the most. He has several um, social media platforms. He has um, so much focus on, on, on this idea that he listens to the citizens, that he receives suggestions, that he is there all the time. And, and it's quite... Um, quite odd, he has an app that is not an app related to the government or, or anything related to politics. It's an app just about himself. If we can go to the next one, please. Um, do you mind clicking on the video? Because this is a, a recording of, of this app of his. And, and Modi has a whole idea of sharing um, supposedly drawings or, or, or pictures or anything that, that shows that people love him and respect him, not as a politician, but as a human, uh, as a person. And oh, I'm, I'm not sure. is it working? Oh, yes. If you log into the website, sorry, the app, you can find paintings, poetry, um, anything related to himself. And these are supposedly done by fellow citizens and brothers of Team India. And he is trying all the time to create this, this bonding with the citizens. Like he has a, a Twitter account and he shares his diet and he recommends what to eat, when to do yoga or not, and he's encouraging people to follow his lifestyle. And and, and he has a whole idea of of showing as, as close to the citizens as he has never done before by any with any other political leader. Um and it, it is really aside the the, the government 
website and everything. It's just uh, sorry. <laughs> it's just about um, about himself. And if we go to these, um, oh, and if we if we analyze the next uh, feature, which is this idea of the authority conceived as personalistic rather than institutional, we have the this quote of, of Modi from 2018, in which he, um, it, it is a, a different approach. He is not saying that he's the one that's going to save India from all the previous poverty and all the problems or anything. He's always saying that he he's eager to, to grow with India and to let India to development. But uh, instead of showing himself as a superhero, he does show himself as a martyr. And he's all the time saying that he suffers because there's poverty, that he feels really bad because people are suffering because of, of whatever other leaders did before. And he personalizes the pain, but he is not showing the this feature of the flaunting of the law as, as an authority that is saving the country beyond any other power. Uh, can we go to the next one? Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the idea of the other presented as a threat, um, there are, there are no clear um, enemies in Modi's discourse until 2016, when he starts talking about the poisonous features of the political opposition. And here is when he clearly mentions the opposition uh, parties, parties' names, uh, politicians' names, and, and he starts saying that th these are the ones that are stopping Team India from moving forward. Um, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, finally, uh, regarding the planting of the law and, and, and presenting politics as accessible, Modi has so many <laughs> ways of um, receiving feedback from the citizens. And, and he has a, a radio show every day, Monkey Bat, where he reads out loud suggestions from the fellow citizens. He has uh, an open forum in the in the website, the government website, where you can suggest policies, you can suggest um, topics to discuss uh, with the public the next time he will present himself, etc. However, everything has a, a reference to Hinduism, and and that's that's the problem with the whole idea. This um, notion of, of Team India or this idea of where development is heading to is just focusing on certain um, on certain people that he he can when he defines the people of India he defines them regarding the inheritance of of, of those deities from Hinduism somehow he is trying to create this this nation that comes from Hinduism or that some uh, Hindu nationalist called Hindustan, and he is trying to um, to show how development is done or is going to happen for this specific group. And as, as as we were talking before, this is when populism becomes dangerous because these the the um, the definition of the people is just for a few ones and. And he is excluding from the whole discourse and from his whole performance and his whole behavior in public many other religious, um, what well, are not even minorities in India, <laughs> but many other religious uh, groups that are also present in the country. Can we go to the next one, please? So um, now we go to the Indonesian case. And here we have two quotes from Jokowi. Um, and something really common in Jokowi's public speeches is that he always starts his 
performances or, or uh, public appearances by reciting the Tasmia. Um, and after reciting it in Arabic, he starts um, greeting different religious groups in different languages. And that happened all the time as a, as a rule. And it's not clear, and it didn't happen in any public discourse until 2017, when he starts specifying what the nation or the citizenship of an Indonesia was. And he also traced back this idea of, of, of nation to the Islamic fighters who took the country or, or who led the independent move, independence movement. And he also tried to, in all of his speeches, to mention different islands, trying to bring them all together and, and, and to create this feeling of togetherness despite all, all, all the difference and, and in the region. And this idea of nativism in Jokowi is, is perhaps the most traditionally associated to populism. He's always trying to talk about uh, the nation of being the one from that land, uh, the ones, the, or the original ones. And if we remember, Indonesia had a, a, a genocide um, in the 60s, where, where they actually killed all, all the foreign people, especially Chinese minorities. And this is why it's, it's a bit tricky and dangerous trying to, to specify that the Indonesian person is the one that can trace back their route to the land, as, as Jokowi normally does. Next one, please. When we analyze um, the flaunting of the law in Jokowi's public performances, uh, the anti-elite rhetoric thing, uh, feature of, of it, is a bit um, is a bit clear as we can see in this quote. We can see how he talks about the new paradigm uh, because things cannot longer be delayed. Money cannot be used to pay official travels and, and, and meetings and, and, act, and, and money has to go to the people and it's something that he's going to do now. Uh, we can see now, he says, we can no longer uh, use this. These are the ways that he refers to the prior leaders and how they didn't help the nation as he will do. Next one, please. Regarding the emphasis on closeness, uh, Jokowi has also uh, a big presence in social media and, and most of the um, analysts say that his followers are mainly millennials following him on TikTok and YouTube and, and Twitter at the time I did this study. Jokowi is always trying to show details of his personal life. He he actually shows really detailed procedures of, of how to make breakfast, recipes, detox drinks. And if we, we click on that video, we can see how he was sharing her his haircut and, and encouraging that's in, in Bahasa, but that says that he's encouraging people to get an undercut as well to look like him. So uh, after this video, he started a campaign. So it was a hashtag. Everyone had to get the JKW hashtag and undercard. And, and people were sharing how they did get the same um, 
hairstyle as a as a president. Uh, Jokowi is is trying so much to share his personal life that he has um, a video blog where his song is 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 being interviewed and people can ask him personal details about the president's life. He's actually acting like a influencer. He's responding like that. He is creating challenges. Um, that's the way he's run his election. His idea of, of closeness is, is quite direct. He is sharing his personal life with the citizens. Next one, please. Regarding um, this feature of the flaunting of the law where the author authority is conceived as personalistic rather than institutional, Jokowi rarely mentions this. He does not express any, any feature of, 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 of this flaunting of the law characteristic. He's never trying to talk about himself as a political leader. He's so much focusing on, on showing himself as a person that he never talks about anything else regarding this, this institutional power or anything like that. Next one, please. Regarding the fact um, that this feature of the flaunting of the law where the other, this empty signifier of the other is presented as a threat. In the case of, of Jokowi's performances, he always talks about the enemy that is outside of the border, the, the enemy that is outside of the border and is trying to steal our money and is trying to steal um, our development. And, and it is, as I said before, it is really, really, really traditionally understood as, as populism, right? Like the, the enemy is outside. We, we are the ones that are from this land, we are the native ones, we are the ones that deserve uh, a better life. And that's why he has a focus on, on always mention the, the hard work of, of the TNA, TNA, sorry, which is the National Defense Force that are normally working at the borders. And that's really common through all his speeches. We can go to the next one. Uh, regarding the politics as accessible, and as I said before, um, Joko is trying to picture himself as a really humble man. He has a video blog and on his ch YouTube channel where he shows how he use or buy uh, shoes, and he's always wearing. And this, this is a photo of his political campaign. He's actually sh sharing how much his um, trousers cost his shoes cost <laughs> and, and he's trying to use the same outfit all the time. It's, it's always a white shirt and um, black trousers. They are made in Indonesia. He's always trying to show that everyone can be like him. And this is a way of, of creating this, this bonding with the people because he is one of them and you can be one present one day perhaps. Um, can we go to the next one? Okay, so overall, um, and I really run <laughs> this time, um, both of the leaders are, are trying to create this, this identification with the citizens in such clear ways, focus on, on so much on closeness, trying to picture themselves as humble people, as one of, of, of any uh, of the citizens, they are completely against showing themselves as, as they are high ruling leads or anything like that. Um, and then, um, and they, they are using two different strategies. Modi perhaps is, is, is more clear on, on, on mentioning this, this idea of the, the previous leaders were weren't doing enough. I'm the one that can can actually change India, and and he's focusing on his personal image rather than um, the power of the government. Whereas Jokowi is just trying to 
to please the audience and, and, and trying to just look humble, leaving politics aside. And but both of them are using populism as a strategy to to get the people identify with themselves. Um, if we think of this as, as, as a threat to democracy or, or is a possibly um, dangerous thing, well, we have that both countries have these issues regarding the, the religious or, or ethnic minorities. They are both uh, being accused of human rights violations. They are both accused of impunity when a victim is a, a, a minority. And on top of that, the leaders are creating this notion of the citizens, this idea or concept of the people that never includes them. Modi uh, is always referring back to uh, Hindustan and, and Hinduism deities or references. He talks in, in really significant places for, um, um, for, for the religion. And, and he is just ignoring all the things that are happening against Muslim population in the background. Whereas Jokowi is, is doing exactly the same. He, he can greet everyone in every, every religion or every language. But he is always saying that we are the ones that deserve um, the, the development of our nation because our, our ancestors fought for the country uh, and they follow the Quran and blah, 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 blah. That is happening at the same time that um, Hindu minorities have been killed because, um, because they are not Muslim in the country. So there are so many things that happen that seems to be quite unfortunate that they are, they are just ignoring these, the whole, this whole background of minorities being affected and um, if we, we, we take this idea of the public speech as, as a way of creating the, the um, definition of, of what a citizen should be like, well, then we have this encouragement of, of hate crimes and discriminations and this idea that the other one is going to be the threat that, that takes you and your family into poverty or into crime or anything like that. So. I think this is one of the cases, or these two are um, cases in which we can question like, okay, this idea of, of populism and this construction of, of the people, it can actually affect democracy, uh, democracy in, in countries that have been doing well regarding um, the democratic stability. Um, that's all on me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chiara. That was indeed very, very interesting. And, and I thought it was actually um, a very good supplement to, to the paper that you published with our journal because it did uh, add some additional context and background and examples of, uh, uh, of what you identify as the attempt of those leaders to uh, frame it and identify the idea of the people. And in that respect, I thought it was a, a very nice follow-up to Dominic's uh, presentation because it kind of offered this uh, a practical application of, uh, of what Dominic was describing earlier as uh, uh, the construction of the concept of the people. Uh, with that said, I'd like to thank both of you for your presentations uh, and we can now move to the Q&A session um, uh, to the Q&A part of this session. So if anyone has a question, you can uh, raise it in the chat or you can ask it here uh, in person. Uh, I do have a few comments. Uh, so let's see if anyone else wants to get us started or else I can, uh, I can begin. Okay, so we can we do have a few questions here, but we can leave them for later. So let me start by offering a comment on on Kiara's presentation, since this was the second one that we can hear. Uh, so Kiara and Dominique, if both of you can switch on your cameras, that will make for a bit of uh, a better discussion or conversation, sort of say, even in this 
um, a virtual context. Uh, so, Kara, my, my, my question is the following. I do understand what you were trying to do with uh, with both, both Jacobi and, and Modi, and in a sense, your presentation did offer quite an insight into the way in which social media can be used by these populist leaders, and we've also seen that in the US. Uh, with the use of Twitter by Donald Trump and the way that he used it, which in some ways it was very remarkably similar to what you were describing that uh, those uh, other figures are doing. But my, my question is the following. Do you think or to what extent do you think that the impact of that use in those countries was different compared to that of Donald Trump in the US, for instance, because of the underlying socio-political context of those countries. So, for instance, you did mention that both of them are democratic. Uh, we can certainly debate that because it depends on what understanding of democracy you're proposing. They're certainly not what one might call, you know, a, a long-standing, a stable democracy with general human rights for everyone and so forth and so forth because of the reasons you mentioned, right? You mentioned those religious conflicts and the constant human rights violations for minorities and so forth. So to what extent do you think that the different impact that those leaders has, have can be attributed to that already unstable democratic structure, sort of say? And to what extent might their impact be limited in a more stable democratic structure or we might say a liberal democratic structure that offers those liberal protections of, of human rights and so forth. Oh, I'm sorry, you're still muted. Yeah, I just noticed that. Um, I think it's important to to notice, we, we have, for example, in, in the US, uh, Latinos that have been persecuted and, and that happens all the time and they've been affected even nowadays. But I think it is important to to bear in mind that the history, the recent history of India and, and Indonesia, Indonesia had a, a massive killing um, quite recently where, where we don't know. I mean, they, they never reflect on that. They just killed minorities. They just killed foreign people. They didn't understand that. They didn't reflect on that. Whereas in India, we had the, the, the partition of India, we had the whole division and all the crisis that just happened. And, and it's a society that, and as you said, I, I will never um, talk about how remarkable democracy is in, in those countries because they are really broken and that just happened. And I think the reason that these leaders can, can have, a, or their discourses can have a, a, a huge impact um, is is not causing obviously the the mass killings and the persecution to the religious minorities, but it's actually allowing that and and showing it as a as a valid reason, and and I think that that in combination with the prior history, which is which is cruel and it's it's recent, it, it, it's just a perfect storm. Thank you very much for, for your response. Yes, I, I tend to agree with, with, with what you've suggested. Um, now, I, I do have also more like a comment to Dominique, uh, because while you were talking, I found myself agreeing with some of the premises you, pro you proposed, but also having difficulty accepting some of the conclusions. So what I mean by that is I I, I tend to agree with your statement about uh, liberalism and neoliberalism um, having the, that anti-democratic element. And, and I think that that can be explained, sort of say, if we juxtapose the liberal aspect of liberal democracy, which is the emphasis on individual rights and so forth, and the democratic aspect of a liberal democracy, which might be identified with uh, uh, either majoritarianism or uh, uh, free speech or political participation or whatever it might be. So I, I, I think I do agree with that with that statement. On the other hand, I, I found it difficult to accept your conclusion that populism is necessary for democracy. 
and, and, and I think that part of the reason why I find myself in, in difficulty of, of accepting that uh, is that to me it seems that it depends on how you understand democracy on one hand and how you understand populism on the other hand. So populism, if, if you frame it the way you have, it seems to be relevant to the majoritarian element of democracy, right? Uh, more so than other parts of democracy. What I mean by that is if you understand democracy in a sort of oh, dissent or free speech, then you might end up with a, a different conclusion. Now, I understand that all of that might not fit neatly into the, the picture you've painted, but that's probably because um, in the, the, the research that I'm doing and in the literature that I study, there's not necessarily this discourse of, um, you know, the people on one hand and everyone else on the other hand. And so I, I, I'm sorry if, if what I've said doesn't make any sense, but it's because I'm, I'm still struggling to understand how what you've suggested might fit with more mainstream democratic theories, for instance, like deliberative democracy or uh, republicanism and radical democracy and so forth. Yeah, qu quite a tough comment. I think the, the only thing I can reply is, is, is Dominic, that could I, you, could you please switch on your camera? It's, it, it's, it's ah, switched it's on. on. I'm, oh, OK, I'm sorry. Yeah. OK, <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, I totally agree that um, yeah, my, my argument completely rests um, in the notion of democracy that I've just uh, presented. And I think the next step would now be to try to, so, so if you wanna buy in my argument, you first have to agree with the conceptualization of populism that I proposed with the discursive approach. And second, you also have to buy in into this radical democratic um, approach um, from from Marcia, Laclau, Muff, and so on and so on. So yeah, I totally agree that the next step would be to to defend, if I would write it down, to defend this model of democracy. Because I would say theory imminent, um, the argument makes sense. So if you present democracy as being based on contingency and conflict and this ethical dimension, then anti-populism runs counter to it. But yeah, really importantly, one has to defend this theory of democracy first. So um, yeah, I, I totally agree that um, this argument doesn't make sense if one takes the, the liberal democratic approach or the republic democratic tradition. So yeah, the argument only makes sense um, within this radical democratic approach from, from Chantal Mouffe, Ernesto Laclau, and Oliver Marshall and others, so yeah. Okay, so th thanks very much for your comment, Dominique. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat, so maybe we can uh, get to them first. So Dinesh has a few questions, I suspect, for Chiara. Uh, how do you define modest populism as right-wing or another type, as it takes not only minorities at stake, but it also affects other classes who oppose the will of modest government? So that's the first aspect of the question on the classification of the specific type of populism espoused by uh, Modi. And the second question, does it just an, a populist idea based on Hindu populism? Ah, so this links to the first question, whether it's a type of Hindu populism. Uh, the third question is, as Modi's populist government takes elite, people, elite people's place, and their interests are protected. How you take differ from original idea of populism, where it goes against the elite? Ah, so here the question is whether the type of populism espoused by Modi, how does it compare with classic notions of populism that portray uh, the people against an elite? Oh, quite a few questions here. Uh, so, Kara, I don't know if you'd like to respond to those couple of questions first. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I can read them here. Um, so I think that Modi does something really interesting because, yeah, he is creating a sort of division, but he's also overcoming other social structure divisions that are in India. He's overcoming caste divisions uh, to create this notion of the people 
based on religion. Uh, so that that's quite interesting because he he just he manages to to do it despite of this whole tradition of, of of social division and social stratification in India, and that's interesting. I do think he has a specific focus on 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 Hinduism. Uh, the more the, well, the more I read about it on the news, every time he is having more controversy regarding other religions in the country. He is trying to, to, to impose this idea of Hinduism as the religion in India. And, and I think, yeah, it would be it would be more linked to that, like a Hindu populism thing rather than a right wing populism, I would say. And the last question is. Um, uh, I don't know if, if, if Modi has a clear uh, strategy of, of going against um, the, the normal or the traditional political elites. I think he, he's doing something clever, never talking about the party, because he comes from a party that has been in power before, but he, he rarely mentions that. He just talks on his, on his behalf. Um, like he he's always focusing on, on himself in, and and his his ideas of in power, and and yeah, I I I don't think he's trying to to recreate a, a more traditional idea of populism here, but I do think it, it has a specific focus on religion. Okay, thank. You. And to what extent do you think? that uh, as Dinesh has suggested earlier, there are some similarities in Modi's Hindu populist and uh, types of right-wing populists that we see in Europe, which on occasion do draw on religion, like in Hungary, for instance. Yeah, I think it's just this idea of, in a really subtle way, trying to exclude people. You are not allowed to say it out loud unless you are Donald Trump. But you, you have your own enemies, and you're trying to 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 deliver this message. I think that there's a commonality between the Western leaders and and what is happening in India and what happens here as well. Um, in in Peru, it, it is it is like a dirty secret between the followers and the leader, right? They are not specifically saying who are they having against, um, but the, there are some ways in, in which they can just suggest uh, that some some citizens are not part of the nation and they, they are going to be excluded either through the discourse or as we see it happens with the minorities, religious minorities in India, or as it happened with the Latino community in the US, or as it happens with all the restrictions that that, that religion uh, religious parties are are imposing in, in, in Europe. So I think um, what they have in common is this this really subtle way of exclusion, allowing exclusion and kind of encouraging. Uh, intolerance in, in a really subtle way. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions for uh, Chiara or Dominic? <laughs> thank you. So, uh, yes, actually, I, I apologize to Dominic, but I didn't hear most of the speech, so I'm not going to be able to comment on Dominic's speech. I apologize. We came in with Dimitri uh, later. But, Chiara, I wanted to ask you, first of all, I noticed the very colorful background of the slides. Is this in reference to the SDGs or is it something different? Oh, no, uh, I was just trying to, to think of what I could have in, in common between India and Indonesia. <laughs> but I think you've got a point there and you should probably have a look at the Sustainable Development Goals because it's exactly the same colors as the ones you've used. Maybe you can try to anchor your work into some of the SDGs. So that was just a nice, you know, uh, side comment. But I was mostly interested, and again, I apologize to Dominic, I'm sure it's relevant to him too. I was most interested in the methodology again. So, like yesterday, we saw, uh, because I went back to the paper, 
uh, we saw that that uh, uh, an analysis through you know variables and um, and I find that very interesting and I'm wondering uh, Andreas whether you know such methodologies are actually what we need you know to work more generally speaking on the rule of law mm -hmm. and European values since we are planning on, on measuring as we can the rule of law European values. So my question to both Dominic and Chiara is perhaps to say a few more words about the methodology and what they have learned from it and what lessons they can draw from their methodology for future work. I asked the same question to Alex yesterday. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Chiara, if you could offer a comment on the methodology you followed for your work. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent this applies to Dominic's work, which is a little bit more doctrinal, but uh, we, we can see if he can offer a comment or two on that. So uh, after reading a lot of critics on, on the post-structuralist discourse analysis, and then actually doing the discourse analysis, on my, my, this was my dissertation, so what, what I can take from it is that there is a lot of things that, that are not said and that they're really hard to measure that they can actually have a big impact as, as we can see like it hasn't been on this presentation because of the time limitations but Modi used to speak only in 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 places that were really significant and were religious centers for for Hinduism so these really, really subtle ways of, of sending a message are, are really impactful. And I think if we take the whole, especially in, in, in topics as populism or political communication, we need to take into account the whole thing. Because it's saying a lot, like um, Modi, for example, was wearing these Nehru neck uh, shirts and they, they, they just represent an, a, a prior political leader who was against the uh, socialist movement in India and that's something I didn't know obviously but my friends from India did and this 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 is really important to understand uh, especially nowadays everything is, is also visual right the, the we have the videos we have the photos uh, we have the the tweets uh, there's a lot to learn from that and and there are so many sources of information that we should all take into account yeah, maybe to to quickly add on this. Uh, yeah, with my, the the research I did for this presentation, um, I didn't really follow a methodology because it was solely theoretical. But maybe from the paper uh, I published in the Interdisciplinary Journal of Populism, they also applied a post-structural discourse analysis. And I think um, the point that Chiara just made is is quite important that by analyzing the discourse, you, you're not just focusing on, on, on the words and the speeches, but also on, on everything else. So, so the style, um, how something is presented, how the discourse is presented. And I think this is a really important uh, add-on um, to, to other kinds of quantitative analysis where you just do like uh, a quantitative analysis um, of different variables in the discourse that you also look on how they are performed and how the style is, because that also says a lot about the discourse as such. And I think that is important uh, reflection that you can yeah, combine both like these um, content analysis with like these more post-structural elements of a discourse analysis to get some sort of a holistic picture of the whole discourse. OK, thank you, Dominic. And let me remind everyone that if you want to see how Dominic has done that with respect to Greta Thunberg, you can visit our website and have a look at, at his article that is uh, quite interesting as well. Um, OK, so with that, I would like to bring this session to a close. Um, let me thank both Dominic and Chiara for joining us. Uh, Chiara, Thanks very much for putting in the effort. I know it's really, really late in Peru now. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to further collaboration with both of you. So thanks very much for uh, joining this session and supporting the conference. Uh, for everyone else, we are going to take a 15 minute break. I'm going to stop the recording now.